Bruno tells a perfectly reasonable lie. For several weeks after this, Bruno continued to leave the house when Erlitz had gone home for the day and Mother was having one of her afternoon naps and made a long trek along the fence to meet Schmuel, who was almost every afternoon was waiting for the airplane, sitting cross-legged on the ground, staring at the dust beneath him. One afternoon, Schmuel had a black eye, and when Bruno asked about it, he just shook his head and said that he didn't want to talk about it. Bruno assumed that they were bullies all over the world, not just in schools in Berlin, and one of them had done this to Schmuel. He felt an urge to help his friend, but he couldn't think of anything he could do to make it better. And he could tell that Schmuel wanted to pretend it never happened. Every day, Bruno asked Schmuel whether he would be allowed to crawl underneath the wire so that they could play together on the other side of the fence. But every day, Schmuel said, no, it wasn't a good idea. I don't know why you're so anxious to come across here to play, said Schmuel. It's not very nice. You haven't tried living in my house, said Bruno. For one thing, it doesn't have five floors, only three. How can anyone live in so small a space as that? He'd forgotten Schmuel's story about 11 people all living in the same room together before they had come to out with, including the boy Luca, who kept hitting him even when he did nothing wrong. One day, Bruno asked why Schmuel and all the other people on the fat side of the fence wore the same striped pajamas and cloth caps. That's what they gave us when we got here, explained Schmuel. They took away our other clothes. But... Don't you ever wake up in the morning and feel like wearing something different? There must be something else in your wardrobe. Shmuel blinked and opened his mouth to say something, but then thought better of it. I don't even like stripes, said Bruno, although this wasn't exactly true. In fact, he did like stripes, and he felt increasingly fed up that he had to wear trousers and shirts and ties and shoes that were too tight for him when Shmuel and his friends got to wear striped pajamas all day long. A few days later, Bruno woke up, and for the first time in weeks, it was raining heavily. It had started at some point during the night, and Bruno even thought that it might have woken him up. But it was hard to tell, because once he was awake, and there was no way of knowing how that had happened. As he ate his breakfast that morning, the rain continued. For all the morning classes with Air Litz, the rain continued. And while he ate his lunch, the rain continued. And while they finished another session of history and geography in the afternoon, the rain continued. This was bad news, for it meant that he wouldn't be able to leave the house and meet Schmuel. That afternoon, Bruno lay on his bed with a book, but found it hard to concentrate. And just then, the hopeless case came in to see him. She didn't often come into Bruno's room, preferring to arrange and rearrange her collection of dolls constantly during her free time. However, something about the wet weather had put her off her game, and she couldn't face playing it again just yet. What do you want? asked Bruno. <laughs> That's a nice welcome, said Bruno. I'm reading, said Bruno. What are you reading? she asked again. And rather than answer... He simply turned the cover toward her so she could see for herself. She made a raspberry sound through her lips, and some of her spit landed on Bruno's face. Boring, she said in a sing-song voice. It's not boring at all, said Bruno. It's an adventure. It's better than dolls, that's for sure. Gretel didn't rise to the bait on that one. What are you doing, she repeated, irritating Bruno even further. I told you I'm trying to read, he said in a grumpy voice. If some people would just let me. I've got nothing to do, she replied. I hate the rain. Bruno found this hard to understand. It wasn't as if she ever did anything anyway. Unlike him, who had adventures and explored places and had made a friend, she very, very rarely left the house at all. It was as if she decided to be bored simply because on this occasion she didn't have a choice about staying inside. But still, there are moments when a brother and sister can lie down their instruments of torture for a moment and speak as civil human beings. And Bruno decided to make this one of those moments. I hate the rain, too, he said. I should be with Schmuel by now. He'll think I've forgotten him. The words were out of his mouth quicker than he could stop them, and he felt a pain in his stomach and grew furious with himself for saying that. You should be with who? asked Gretel. Who, what's that? asked Bruno, blinking back at her. You should be with who? asked Gretel. Who did you say you should be with? she asked again. I'm sorry, said Bruno, trying to think quickly. I didn't quite hear you. Could you say that again? Why did you, who did you say you had to be with? She shouted, leaning forward so that there could be no mistake this time. I never said I should be with anyone, he said. Yes, you did. You said that someone will think you've forgotten them. Pardon? Bruno, she said in a threatening voice. Are you mad? He asked, trying to make her think that she had entirely made it up. Only he wasn't very convincing, for he wasn't a natural actor, like Grandmother, and Gretel shook her head and pointed a finger at him. 
What did you say, Bruno? She insisted. You said there's someone you should be with. Who was it? Tell me. There's no one around here to play with, is there? Bruno considered the dilemma he was in. On one hand, his sister was his sister, and he had one crucial thing in common. They weren't grown-ups. And although he never bothered to ask her, there was every chance she was just as lonely as he was at Outwood. After all, back in Berlin, she had Hilda and Isabel and Louise to play with. They may have been annoying girls, but at least they were her friends. Here she had no one at all except her collection of lifeless dolls. Who knew how mad Gretel was after all? Perhaps she thought the dolls were talking to her. But at the same time, there was the undeniable fact that Schmuel was his friend and not hers, and he didn't want to share him. There was only one thing for it, and that was to lie. I have a new friend, he began. A new friend that I go to see every day. And he'll be waiting for me now. But you can't tell anyone. Why not? Because he's an imaginary friend, said Bruno, trying his best to look embarrassed. Just like Lieutenant Cotler had when he had been trapped in his story about his father in Switzerland. We play together every day. Gretel opened her mouth and stared at him before breaking into a laugh. An imaginary friend, she cried. Aren't you a little old for an imaginary friend? Bruno tried to look ashamed and embarrassed in order to make his story more convincing. He squirmed on the bed and didn't look her in the eye, which worked a treat and made him think that perhaps he wasn't such a bad actor after all. He wished that he could make himself go red, but it was very difficult to do. So he thought of embarrassing things that had happened to him over the years and wondered whether these would do the trick. He thought at the time he had forgotten to lock the bathroom door and grandmother had walked in and seen everything. He thought of the time when he had put his hand up in class and called the teacher mother, and everyone had laughed at him. He thought of the time he'd fallen off his bicycle in front of a group of girls when he was trying to do a special trick and cut his knee and cried. One of them worked, and his face started to go red. Look at you, said Gretel, confirming it. You've gone all red. Because I didn't want to tell you, said Bruno. An imaginary friend. Honestly, Bruno, you're a hopeless case. Bruno smiled because he knew two things. The first was that he had got away with his lie, and the second was that if anyone was the hopeless case around here, it wasn't him. Leave me alone, he said. I want to read my book. Well, why don't you lie down and close your eyes and let your imaginary friend read it to you, said Gretel, delighted with herself now because she had something on him, and she wasn't going to let it drop in a hurry. Save you a job. Maybe I should send him to throw all your dolls out of your window, he said. You do, and there'll be trouble, said Gretel, and he knew that she meant it. Well, tell me this, Bruno. What do you and this imaginary friend of yours do together that makes him so special? Bruno thought about it. He realized that he actually wanted to talk about Shmuel a little bit, and this might be a way to do it without having to tell her the truth about his existence. We talk about everything, he told her. I tell him about our house back in Berlin and all the other houses and the streets and the fruit and vegetable stalls and cafes and how you shouldn't go to town on a Saturday afternoon unless you want to get pushed from pillar to post and about Carl and Daniel and Martin and how they were my three best friends for life. How interesting, said Gretel sarcastically. She had recently had a birthday and turned 13 and thought that sarcasm was the very height of sophistication. And what does he tell you? He tells me about his family and the watch shop that he used to live over, and the adventures he had coming here, and the friends he used to have, and the people he knows here, and about the boys who he used to play with, but he doesn't anymore, because they disappeared without ever saying goodbye to him. Well, he sounds like a barrel of laughs, said Gretel. I wish he was my imaginary friend. And yesterday, he told me that his grandfather hadn't been seen for days, and no one knows where he is, and whenever he asks his father about him, he starts crying and hugs him so hard that he's worried he's going to squeeze him to death. Bruno got to the end of the sentence and realized that his voice had gone very quiet. These were things that Shmuel had told him, but for some reason he hadn't really understood at the time how sad that must have been for his friend. When Bruno said them out loud himself, he felt terrible that he hadn't tried to say something to cheer Shmuel up, and instead had started talking about something silly, like exploring. I'll say sorry for that tomorrow, he told himself. If father knew you were talking to imaginary friends, you'd be in for it, said Gretel. I think you should stop. Why? asked Bruno. Because it's not healthy, she said. It's the first sign of madness. Bruno nodded. I don't think I can stop, he said, after a long pause. I don't think I want to. 
All the same, said Gretel, who was becoming friendlier and friendlier by the second. I'd keep it to myself if I were you. Well, said Bruno, trying to look sad, you're probably right. You won't tell anyone, will you? She shook her head. No one, except my own imaginary friends. Bruno gasped. Do you have one? He asked, picturing her at another part of the fence, talking to a girl her own age, the two of them being sarcastic together for hours at a time. No, she said, laughing. I'm 13 years old, for heaven's sake. I can't afford to act like a child, even if you can. And with that, she flounced out of the room, and Bruno could hear her talking to her dolls in the room across the hall and scolding them for getting themselves into such a mess while her back was turned. And she had no choice but to rearrange them. And did they think that she had nothing better to do with her time? Some people, she said loudly, before getting down to work. Bruno tried to return to his book, but he lost interest in it for now and stuck, stared out at the rain instead and wondered whether Shmuel, wherever he was, was thinking about him too and missing their conversation as much as he was.